Our next speaker is Dave Furr. He's a senior fellow lead for the Materials and Process Engineering Organization at Pratt & Whitney. He has been charged with leading the development of technical strategies for the development and improvement of engineering standards for all processes in the Pratt & Whitney Materials and Process Discipline. Dave received his Ph.D. from the University of Ulm in Germany. He is an American, did his undergraduate here, came back and is working here. Previously, Dave was Chief of Strategic Metals and Process Technology and Fellow of Materials and Process Modeling at Rolls-Royce, where he led the development and acquisition of advanced materials and process technologies. He also worked at Laddish Company, where he developed and delivered unique thermomechanical processing technology for aerospace and general industrial industries. He has over 20 years of experience in aerospace engineering, manufacturing, and materials and process modeling. Good day. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'm uh, honored to be here, and uh, I'm going to go through my case study, which is very, very similar to what Gern just uh, showed. Uh, the issues of where are we, what are some gaps, and what are the opportunities. And I'm going to talk about that relative to designing components and designing systems. In specific, uh, I'll talk about uh, jet engines and, and aerospace and, and also automotive. The issue we have today in front of us is materials are critical to everything we do. Everything that we make is made, made from materials, engineered materials. So how do we actually do that? How do we actually think up, of a, new, think up a new material, develop it, define it, and then repeatedly make it? We do that today, um, and traditionally we have done that, through trial and error methods. So we understand what a material is like, start doing trial and error, start using more sophisticated tools like uh, design experiments, more and more uh, sophisticated tools. We're now into the era of actually using computational tools. One of the things, though, that we have is an infrastructure. That's one thing I want to have as a, a theme or message, is we have an infrastructure for the materials community, uh, as well as a manufacturing community. And our infrastructure we have today is we have static specifications. So we design a material, and it's supposed to work for that application across the board, no matter what you want to use it for. So we're not really agile. So if we want to have a material slightly change it for a specific application, it might take a very long time to actually get that into uh, purpose or into, into production. How do we change that speed of getting those materials into, into use? The issue, too, that we have is linking materials, manufacturing, and process development and component design into one thing. Today, we actually take multiple disciplines within many, many organizations. We do designing of components, very, very ingenious designs. We then go to a materials organization, ask them, what kind of materials do you have that would actually fit that kind of application? Then you go to another organization that does manufacturing. Well, how are you going to make this, this component or system? And it's substantially compartmentalized, or has been. The issue of concurrent engineering has helped things out quite substantially, where teams or groups come together to work on those kind of functions. What we're talking about is concurrent engineering here today, computationally. So it's all done all automatically together. So linking as we have, work, uh, linking today designs with manufacturing, with materials as a seamless activity is really a major, major uh, activity and function that we could be, should be looking at, and it's a huge opportunity for us for global competitiveness. Um, the issue, too, also of uh, integration of computational materials. So there's a term that's been used, ICME, or Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. So integration. How do we get computational materials into our workplace? Um, again, prediction of component properties so how do we know that when we're going to make something, it's going to actually produce the properties that we want it? Let's predict it up front. Let's make sure we understand why it's going to behave the way it does. Optimizing our materials and processes to get the enhancements that we want out of a component. We, again, we can do that through modeling and simulation. Enhance process yields and reduce cost. If there's a process that we're producing, a given geometry, and that geometry is really hard to produce, are there things we can do with the design, with the process, to make sure that every part we produce is 100% perfect and 100% yield? Uh, reduce the time for new technology implementation. 
Again, today it takes quite a long time to develop an alloy, understand it fully to the point that we can actually apply it into a production application. So we need to be working on reducing that time, increasing our speed uh, to market. This chart here is a quick schematic of that. If you take a look at uh, development uh, time, and development time can be development time for an alloy, a new manufacturing process, or development of a new component or system, a geometry, a part. And if you did it the old way, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, yeah, you'll get to some point where you have some level of quality, some level of cost, and some level of capability. Oftentimes, if you're making parts and you have to set, set up a factory, you'll end up with some definition of a manufacturing process, and it'll be a fixed process, and you'll stop at your yield, your performance, your capability, and you really don't go up on that curve any longer. If you do, it's going to be incremental at times. What we're looking at today is radically changing how we actually introduce new materials, new manufacturing processes into our designs through simulation and getting up that learning curve really, really quickly. So that's, that's one of the, the major uh, benefits by using computational methods and integrating component design, materials design, and manufacturing process design. It's been done already um, in feasibility studies. I, I want to note that really in feasibility studies. There's been a lot of work and a lot of notoriety given to an effort looking at automobile engines. Um, there's groups around the world have been looking at this. Ford Motor Company, John Allison has, has uh, written numbers of uh, articles in this area of looking at designing of an alloy, a manufacturing process, all the way down to how does it impact the component performance within a automobile engine. Again, higher performance, lower cost, greater yields, faster to market, all the things that have been worked on. Similarly, another company, Briggs & Stratton, people make lawnmowers and weed whackers, they actually are doing quite a bit of simulation as well. They're actually using simulations to model making engine uh, cases and looking at where the components will have uh, various attributes, bringing that back into design. Similarly, the forging industry, looking at making aerospace parts or any other kind of part, trying to understand how to do those processes affect and impact uh, a material, and how does that finally impact the final parts. So it, it has been done, it is being done in, in various pockets and various areas. The issue is, is it being done enough, and is it being done in an infrastructural way that we can continue to grow it? Is it also being done with a means of growing our community and growing the student and student base to fulfill the needs that we're growing in industry. I don't think we are, and I think there's an opportunity there. I think there's a, a very, very large opportunity to look at our um, future engineers uh, looking at this, this area. This is another area, another example, uh, a little bit closer, near and dearer to me, the issue of turbine engines. This is a cross-section of the uh, latest and greatest in architectures of, of turbine engines. It's the geared turbofan. Uh, by uh, Pratt Whitney, and it's a totally new architecture, and it's looking at double-digit uh, savings in fuel, uh, specific fuel consumption. Double-digit savings, radical savings because of architecture, design. If you can now link that design with the mechanical design, geometry, link that with manufacturing processes, link that with material behavior, material models, you can even get further increases in capability. A feasibility program was done, and was done a, a few years ago, and it was looking at doing multiple loops, iterations, on optimizing a disk configuration. And that disk configuration was looking at, can you make fit, form, and function out of this component, but leaving a large number of, of the attributes float? And can we take that disk uh, component and say, we're not going to even fix the local properties. We don't want the whole thing to be one property. We'll allow it to be any property that material will be able to give us, and we'll, we'll use it. It turns out that after doing a number of, of cases, the issue of coming up with a 19% weight savings on a part, a nickel-based superalloy, 19% weight reduction, a 19% speed increase on that component, wow, that now starts to become radical. So this is actually, again, was a feasibility program, and it is being worked 
within our company and many other companies incrementally trying to move this forward. But again, I have to go back to what Gern mentioned, data, data, and data, and infrastructure. If you don't have people, don't have the, the data required to run models, this kind of activity, though feasible, is uh, very, very challenging. <clears throat> Challenges, again, to uh, uh, an effective ICME uh, deployment, ICME, Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, we need accurate models. So uh, institutes, universities, uh, government labs working on models, very, very important. Um, efficient simulation software tools, how do we take those models and make them run at speeds where we humans can actually uh, obtain answers? Some of these models can run for days, weeks, months. Uh, we need things fast to run many inter iterations. Uh, data and databases, absolutely critical to the, uh, this, this function moving forward. Industrial standards uh, for the methods and protocols. How do these models talk to each other? If we're going to go and do a multidisciplinary optimization, so mechanical engineers are, going to, are now going to start talking to materials engineers computationally. And materials engineers are going to be talking to manufacturing engineers computationally through models. How are we going to do that with standards? Uh, computational model linkages uh, to the design function, and that, I that issue, too, of well-trained interdisciplinary workforce. So having uh, universities, having a training program to make sure that we understand computational methods, absolutely required, but also thinking about that relative to other disciplines so that they can speak to each other. So a unique engineering skill set are required to support each of these challenges and again, that is a, an opportunity that we have because the U.S. has been very, very strong at education and bringing out new ideas and concepts. We need to keep further, furthering that. Uh, there is actually a computational uh, supply chain approach, or if you look at it as a supply chain, it's actually a, a thought process supply chain. It's not actually delivering a part. It's delivering a method of making a decision. So everything we're looking at in a computational model it doesn't make a car, it doesn't make a jet engine, it makes decisions or helps engineers make decisions. So in doing that, we need to again have fundamental models and software packages. We need to be able to maintain those tools, uh, databases and how to generate databases and application engineers and engineering and also customer approval and certification, big issues. But working together Again, more opportunities where industry, government labs, academia, and software companies need to start linking together and making this happen as an infrastructure, a U.S. infrastructure. Uh, steps toward a strong national ICME capability for global competitiveness. This is a major issue, that title, because uh, we're not alone in the world. Uh, the rest of the world is doing the same thing, and they're going off in a very, very... Uh, a strong way to do these kind of tools, make these kind of tools, make this kind of infrastructure. So we need to be thinking about it as well. So establishing a national priority, understanding that integrated computational materials engineering really effectively, interdisciplinary engineering and science is really important. Uh, developing a focus uh, or focused uh, initiatives where universities, industry, and government can work together standard for computational protocols and databases, and development uh, of initiatives aimed at uh, implementation of these tools within industry. It is another opportunity for us because we, I think, as a nation, are, are very, very uh, innovative at coming up with tools, models, and methods. We need to be as innovative in how we apply them, actually put them out there into use within every company. Any company makes a lawnmower uh, through a, a toothbrush to a jet engine, we need to be understanding how to use these tools faster and, uh, and better. Uh, integrated computational materials engineering, again, has the potential to dramatically change how we uh, design materials, processes, and, and make components, uh, absolutely affecting cost and time to, for delivery. Uh, computational materials engineering enables a virtual manufacturing world. So let's design it on a computer. Let the generation that's coming up behind us, who is so, so adapted to computational methods, it's actually second nature, 
let them start looking at it and start doing optimization designing on the computer as they're doing uh, many other uh, activities within the computer today. Um, application of ICME, uh, again, has several challenges. Again, having trained practitioners is a, is a major issue that we need to be worrying about. Uh, development, maintaining, uh, uh, again, all of these various models and, and codes along with data and databases. So lots and lots of opportunities. Huge amount of feasibility has been shown. Absolutely, there's been a lot of applications to these tools, but I think there's a lot of opportunity yet that we can uh, work toward uh, as we come together and, and move forward for the future. Thank you. Very good.